Hello everyone. Welcome to this update on COVID-19, which is presented by three university and non-university hospitals in the Netherlands, the UK and in France. My name is Matthias Prokop from the University Medical Center in Nijmegen. And uh, I would like to welcome our participants, uh, Dr. Russell Bull from the Royal uh, Bournemouth Infirmary in uh, uh, the UK, the uh, professors Ohana and Oa from the University of Strasbourg, and uh, Monique, Dr. Monique Brink from our university, the Radboud uh, University Medical Center in Nijmegen. In this meeting, we will hear the experience in the various countries when it comes to imaging uh, at COVID, the approaches in the different countries, and the experiences in how we use especially CT in the workup of the disease. I would like to start with Dr. Russell Bull from uh, Bournemouth to give us his impressions on COVID-19 in the UK. Yeah, just get my presentation up on the screen. I just wanted to, it's a brief presentation, really. I wanted to share some of our experiences in the UK. Um, we're at General Hospital, the Royal Bournemouth Hospital. We've, we're a 900 bedded general hospital. And we're also uh, the regional car, uh, center for many things, including cardiology, interventional radiology, urology. So we're a kind of big hospital. We, from next year, in fact, we're gonna be a university hospital as well. But so we're quite big, but we're very general. The only thing we don't do is pediatrics, but we do everything else. We've got uh, 20 staff radiologists, three CT scanners. Uh, we've got one 64 slice CXL um, and two Genesis scanners. So we're a, a fairly typical large hospital in the UK. So, about five weeks ago when COVID-19 started to, well, at least we really thought it was going to hit, we basically cancelled everything pretty much. We were told that there was this huge wave of cases coming. Uh, London had already had lots of cases, so we were told it was coming to us. So we cancelled pretty much everything. So all outpatient scanning was pretty much cancelled, apart from the very most urgent cancer scanning. And then we directed... Uh, all of our resources to staff two inpatient CT scanners basically we went down from MRI we went down from four scanners to one and we we basically uh, we usually have one inpatient scanner so we had two so we did leave one outpatient scanner for uh, very urgent cancer cases um, but that was it so we pretty much our only inpatient CT we diverted everything to uh, we stopped all cardiac CT and MR completely uh, fifty percent of the radiologists were sent home basically to for, to home report um, and the system Im immediately crashed because suddenly uh, there was large numbers of people home reporting, and the maximum bandwidth that the remote access server could support, which was designed for basically i t people dialing into the system, was fifteen megabits and it couldn 't cope with you know suddenly ten radiologists dialing in pulling up images so the IT were very good and they replaced the server and now we can, we can if, if our connection was supported, we're up to 300 megabits from home. So that was solved. But that was, so basically the rest of the hospital as well went into complete emergency mode. They cancelled everything pretty much. All elective cardiology was cancelled, everything. So all, the only uh, PCI carrying on was, a, was primary PCI for acute MI. Everything else was cancelled. All non-acute surgery was, uh, all non-urgent surgery was cancelled. So pretty, almost everything. Um, outpatient visit, the outpatient department was closed. The physicians were all redeployed to full shifts for acute medicine. So rheumatologists you know, were then becoming acute medical, medical physicians and they were, all on 20, they were all on shifts. So staffed by consultants 24 hours a day. So it's a huge change. And, um, so that was a reorganization in the main hospital, but then in radiology, we were kind of all making it up as we went along as the world tried to get used to this. And there were, there were guidelines came out from the surgeons in the UK, uh, probably not discussed necessarily very much with radiology, that all patients who were gonna have any 
acute surgery or any surgery, in fact, needed a screening CT chest to make sure they didn't have COVID-19. So we switched to a system where we were suddenly, every, every patient who was going for surgery, and there weren't that many, were, was having a CT of their chest. Uh, that, in, our experience of that, and I'm interested to hear what other people were, were if the patient was well and asymptomatic, we, we d really didn't pick anything up. We, uh, we picked up pretty much no unexpected cases. And uh, we've actually abandoned doing that now. We, if the patient's asymptomatic, we actually don't do that anymore. But we, that, that was what we did initially because we thought that was a good idea. That's what the surgeons thought was a good idea. But their advice has changed now as well. One thing we did do, this was when we went into emergency mode, and we still do because we think we feel it's pretty useful, is we do all acute abdomens, we do a CT chest. Because we found that a lot of, it's quite a common presentation of COVID-19, particularly in young people, it seems, is to present with abdominal pain rather than chest symptoms. And so we do a chest on all abdo pelvises on CT, and we've found quite a, quite a lot of unexpected COVID on that. So we still do that. So basically, we, we were all in emergency mode and we waited for this huge tsunami of cases to come and everyone was just waiting. And I have to say that the kind of good news is we, it never quite happened. Now, we, we've had a lot of COVID, um, but we've never had that huge wave we we're expecting. And I, I, I'll just ex try to explain why, I think. As you, this is the cases of... COVID across the UK. This is just zoomed in on the south of England here. Um, as you can see, it's very much London-centric COVID, uh, or it's certainly big conurbation. So London, the West Midlands, uh, is basically people where there's a lot of people living close together have a huge instance of COVID, and particularly in the particularly London. And London was about two weeks ahead, and still is about two weeks ahead of us. And they'd had a huge number of deaths. They'd had completely full ITU units. And they were two weeks ahead. So we, by do, basically the whole country kind of went into lockdown. And what's happened is that we've never seen the surge of cases that they had in, um, in London. So we, our ITUs are not full. Or we've gone up from a capacity of about 15 beds to potentially 40. But we're not using anything like that number. We're, you, we're sort of at normal ITU capacity. Um, and we've just never had that surge. But as I said, we still see a lot of COVID. So we've had, we've not as much as London would, but we've yeah, even with we can cope. But we've, but we've seen a lot of COVID, and we this is kind of a fairly typical thing that we see. This is someone with fairly mild symptoms. This had a I haven't shown the chest X-ray, but chest X-ray was normal, but they strongly suspected COVID clinically. And we've got these patchy brown glass changes at the left base. They eventually tested PCR positive for COVID. I can't actually prove that these changes are good of COVID, but we've got a PCR positive person with subtle ground glass changes. So I think that that's what it is. Of course, in our current clinical environment, the pretest probability for COVID is so high that pretty much if we see any ground glass change, we're kind of calling it COVID, even though we accept that there may be other viruses like adenovirus or respiratory syncytial virus or whatever, that, or influenza even, that might cause similar changes. But it's just in our current environment, we're calling them COVID. This is the other end of the spectrum, uh, gross consolidation and ground glass change throughout both lungs, um, but with also with a lot of thrombus in the uh, pulmonary vessels. I'll come back to that later. We, I'm calling it thrombus now rather than emboli because I'm not entirely convinced these are emboli. But this, this poor woman was 45 years old, came in looking like this and had a, um, and subsequently arrested and she was, uh, she was essentially brain dead. And the, so we're seeing, not many cases like this, luckily. London has seen a lot of cases like this, but we're, we're seeing some. One issue we have had, and I've got some other experts on the line who, can, who are much more expert at this than me because they develop the software, is we, we use uh, our standard protocol for all CTPA studies, all outpatients and, in, and inpatients at our institution is using lung subtraction. So we do a pre-contrast, post-contrast, and we subtract the two to get ID maps of the lungs. And we find that, in the normal population, we find that fantastically useful because, but it, interesting in COVID, because there's so much consolidation and ground glass in the lungs, what the software excludes those bit of, those bit of lung from the um, analysis. So we 
can only see the relatively normal bits of lung for the perfusion map. So this was that this was that lady I showed you earlier. See, so most of the the software has excluded most of the lungs. So in COVID, we I think there needs to be some just slight change of the software to allow us to see iodine concentrations in the consolidated lung as well. It's not a problem we normally have because in the normal population, um, pulmonary embolus doesn't usually cause infarction because the lungs have a dual blood supply so you don't usually see an increased density of the lung so it works fine but in covid the primary condition is lung consolidation so that causes a problem um, something we're seeing really a lot is people who have focal consolidation in the lung with covid we see filling defects in the blood vessels in the arteries in the same area and these just to me, certainly don't kind of look like emboli to me. They, you get this, this is an example of a, of a thrombus in the right lower lobe pulmonary uh, artery here in someone with right lower lobe consolidation. And it, there's this kind of irregular filling defect. It's just kind of not the filling defect that you normally get with emboli. And it's also localized only to the areas of consolidation. So, and there is, I, there is some evidence that the COVID causes you know, vascular changes. So. It, I guess one possibility here is that at least some of these cases are not true emboli. They're actually in situ thrombus because of the virus. Uh, and it is incredibly common. We, we seem to see these all the time. And the question is, do you really, do you treat like a normal pulmonary embolus? Is it, I don't think anyone knows the answer, but we're certainly seeing a lot of this. So just trying to think, and it's difficult because we're still in the middle of this crisis, but we're just trying to think of what went well and what didn't go so well. What did go well, um, and this is the experience of lots of other places I talked to in the UK, is that um, everyone in the hospital developed a kind of can-do attitude. People just wanted to sort things out. So people that were departments and people that had been obstructive suddenly became incredibly helpful and actually we could just sort stuff out so things like IT issues and information governance issues things that used to take months were sorted out in a few minutes rather than you know rather than month to month uh, I believe it or not I'm embarrassed to say we didn't have an order comm system before COVID because the physicians were for the five, last five years have blocked impl impl implementation because they wanted to stick with paper because they use paper to drive their workflows and we said, well, the risk of COVID is too high. We don't want paper coming down to the department anymore. We don't want to allow physicians to come to the department anymore with paper. So you're going to have to go to order comms. There was an enormous, very brief complaints for about a day. And then they, everyone accepted it. And now we're completely order comms. So that was good. Um, we've got a very good service for reporting because, we've got, because we never saw this wave. We've got loads of radiologists, some online and some here, waiting to, for the studies. So we report pretty much 100% of all x-rays within 10 minutes, usually within five minutes, and we report almost all CTs within 30 minutes. But I'd say most, probably 99% within 10 minutes. So we're, we are actually waiting for the images to come off the scanner. Now, in the hospital, staff morale actually surprisingly has been excellent. I mean, people are working well together. They actually quite welcome the routine of coming into the hospital rather than sitting at home, and actually it's been good. And um, the image quality has been, we found on both our, on our old 64 and our new Genesis, both the image quality has been almost always excellent. And we haven't, on our old 64 detector system, we haven't tried to kind of achieve the same low dose as we get on the Genesis. It's got older detectors and, and, and all the rest. So we are going for standard image, standard um, doses so not super low doses but it's still pretty low on it so on, you know, we're around one to two millisieverts for chess and but because these are pretty sick patients and we want good image quality we're not trying to you know we're not trying to push the envelope because we've got too much else to do the nice thing as a radiologist and be interested to know what other people say is that we actually most of the patients have actually got something wrong with them which is unusual because we you know, we often get the worried well I think most Western countries do, but these are not the worried well anymore. These people actually have something wrong with them. No, it's, it's bad that these patients are ill, but it, as a radiologist, it's quite interesting that you actually have something to report. So what didn't go so well? Um, there was advice from NHS England regarding personal protective equipment, and that was very confused initially. First of all, Basically, the advice was only to wear masks and gowns and gloves if you think the patient's got COVID. 
now that was that was becoming more and more untenable given that so many of our patients did turn out to have covid so you, what you, what we had a situation where people were the radiographers were wearing no protective equipment we then scanned the chest and it showed florid ground glass change and then everyone felt bad that they hadn't been wearing a mask so that was changed and now for the whole nhs we every patient that any of us see we have to wear at least a mask gloves and a gown if we if we're doing you know ct or whatever so if, if, if it's an aerosolizing procedure you have to wear full um a full filtered mask and everything but in mostly in radiology we're just wearing mask gown gloves um one thing we've really noticed is that our throughput and our two inpatient ct scanners is less than it was on one ct scanner before because we have to do so much cleaning so if a patient has covid uh, or suspected COVID, we have to do a full clean of the scanner, which takes 45 to minutes to an hour. Um, if they don't have COVID, then we can do it. We do a quick clean, which takes five minutes or so. So that's better, but it's really slowed our throughput. Um, because we haven't ever had this wave of emissions that we expected, we've had radiographers, radiologists, and physicians uh, left with not enough to do actually if, if we're honest so we're actually trying to we're actually grateful for cases to report because we we just never got this this wave that we expected um, the big problem we are seeing is that patients with non-covid who are actually quite ill are staying at home they're not coming in and we start we're starting to see conditions that i only saw when i was a young doctor so we're starting to see uh, late presentation myocardial infarct with ruptured VSDs, with ruptured mitral valves. It's conditions that I used to see a lot when I was in my 20s. Um, you don't, you know, we hadn't seen it for years, but we're starting to see it again because people are following the advice that they've got to stay at home, but they, they, it, they that's been too successful and people who are ill should still come into hospital, but they're not. And we're seeing perforated appendixes and all sorts. Um, one thing that we have found is that the, although the morale is great for the doctors, the radiologists who are in the hospital, and I've been in the hospital all the time, it's been, it's been fine. The people at home have found it really difficult. They've found the morale, the morale's been pretty low. They found they feel quite isolated. They find it very difficult to talk to the clinicians. They find it difficult to talk to the other radiologists. So they can see the images okay, but they find it really difficult to communicate. So what are we doing now? So we, this is sort of five weeks on now. So we're trying to get used to the kind of new normal. So what do we do now? We, although the, you know, the, we never got the peak, we have to just adapt now to a sort of long-term situation we feel. Um, we actually are now do, doing actually surprisingly little chest CT for query COVID. Um, we thought we would do lots of it, but we're actually not doing that much. We say we'll do it on anyone, but they, we haven't. Um, the main indication seems to have shaken out to being it's useful to the clinicians when the chest x-ray is normal and they really suspect COVID. Um, and then sometimes you see multifocal ground glass changes. These are you know, symptomatic patients. It seems quite useful. It doesn't seem useful doing CT in asymptomatic patients, but symptomatic patients, it seems useful. And we do do CT for suspected PE. And we find in COVID, as I said, we find a lot of thrombi. Um, we've started trying to recover, even though we're still in the middle of COVID, we're trying to recover because we've got potentially four months worth of, you know, outpatients that are built up. So we're trying to scan the backlog of less urgent CT and MRI cases. And we're using private uh, provider capacity because our two local private hospitals have become NHS hospitals and we're allowed to scan at those hospitals. So we're starting to do that. That's something that the whole NHS in the UK has done. Uh, we've got cardiac ct list now again we started we realized that we were missing a lot of disease and it was you know it's not a good situation we were having a chest pain clinic was sending for exercise testing which wasn't a good thing to do so we're now starting to do cardiac ct again and we're running three lists per week and we're starting to a limited amount of cardiac mr and we do a quick scan of clean after each patient but we do a full clean which takes 45 minutes if the patient's got got covid essentially so <laughs> What would, help, what would help us in the next time when, when we have another pandemic? Because I, I hope I won't see another one, but there may be. Um, I think it's highlighted that our scan rooms, are not. We, we're not used to dealing with infectious diseases. In fact, throughout my whole career as a doctor, and I'm in my mid-50s now, we've never had infections around us. We just don't see infectious diseases. So our, our scan rooms are not designed for it. So it's people are 
dressed in full protective equipment and they have to then open the door with a with the handle and then they de-sterilize the door and that we have to keep cleaning the handles and stuff and and i think our scan rooms could be designed differently with maybe you know some sort of automation uh, one problem we have had is we've had a lots of because we're trying to increase our numbers we've had less experienced radiographers from main x-ray doing ct and they're less experienced they're less confident and also they don't do ct as much so they have really struggled in in the stressful situation um you know not making mistakes and have been mistakes made with protocols and positioning and all the rest of it and what would really help us is if that scanning process was was automated you, the when it's really stressful what you need the scanner to kind of take over i mean uh, you know if tesla can drive my car to work then i, I I'm, I'm hoping that that Canon or whoever can drive my CT scanner because I think it would just help in a really, really stressful environment. Um, we do need better ways of working from home. At the moment, we, our, our home working is, is great for viewing the images, but we then can't communicate with everything. So we, what we need is some way of tying in the packs to systems that we can communicate with our colleagues and you know, have the to have discussions and have discussions with clinicians because we can't do that bit at the moment and that's been that's the the stress for people from home so that's just a brief overview of the uh, situation in the uk things will change all the time we're very much making it up as we go along you know we don't have all the answers and we're just trying to kind of get through this but it's changing really from week to week so i would be I'm happy to take any questions and I'd be very interested to know what every other people's views are across the rest of Europe. Maybe they'll be similar. Thank you, Dr. Paul, for this very interesting presentation. You showed a lot of uh, useful and very recognizable information. Some of the experiences may be different. We have some things that are totally identical, others that are different from what you've said. So I would be very interested to hear what the experience is from Strasbourg which is actually uh, very close to one of the epicenters in France, where uh, the, uh, the caseload is probably much higher. So I would like to give uh, the word to uh, Dr. Ohana. Uh, and uh, we're interested to hear what your experiences are. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. We will present this uh, with uh, Professor Hua. Let me just go full screen. So just to have a look at our COVID-19 activity in our hospital. So we are uh, around the 700 bed hospital, university hospital. We have the uh, infectious uh, medicine department here. So we were like the reference center for our region, for Strasbourg, for COVID-19 patients. So we began our activity in early March around the like, first patient, maybe around four or fifths. And then you see this is the number of uh, chest CT done for suspicion of COVID-19. And this is the number of positive chest CT. And you see that we progressively increased the number doing at the peak, so peak was end of March. We had about like 70 to 80 chest CT per day. And then lockdown, national lockdown was around like March 17. So about 15 days later, we began to see the effect of the lockdown and the number of chest CT of COVID-19 has decreased. What has decreased as well is the number of positive chest CT. So during the peak, we had about 60 to 70 percent of positive and now we currently do around 20 to 30 chest CT for COVID-19 per day, but we have only 10 to 10 uh, yes, you can see that uh, our hospital has been entirely reorganized during uh, this uh, this uh, pandemic, and uh, uh, you can see that almost all the beds in our hospital uh, has been uh, have been involved to COVID uh, nineteen. And you can see that all uh, beds, uh, uh, intensive care unit and conventional beds have been reorganized. And you can see that there is really an inflation. It's coming a little bit after the peak uh, we observe on the uh, emergency unit, because nowadays uh, the beds are full with patients. And 
this is like a line because uh, patients are staying a long time uh, in, uh, in the hospital, of course. And we have also entirely reorganized uh, the emergency unit. You can see at the first part of the slides uh, that uh, uh, our colleague and uh, urgentist, they have uh, uh, reorganized the, the, their unit by creating a, a kind of a lobby just at the entrance of the emergency unit to receive the patient uh, coming uh, from the, their home or coming from the ambulance. And uh, this uh, part uh, is called triage area, and the patient uh, who is arriving in this area uh, had a very quick uh, clinical examination and immediately a blood sample and a nasopharyngeal swab and immediately after the, those two samples, he received a, a, a CT scanner, a non-injected CT scanner, uh, most often a, a low-dose CT scanner. And after that, we are uh, performed the diagnosis uh, and the report immediately. And after that, uh, he, uh, the patient is uh, 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 and is, is going to a uh, post uh, medical advanced post with another clinic, uh, clinical examination, and the decision is, is done. Uh, some some patients are going to home because they are a moderate illness or very uh, no um, uh, no really uh, disease or very mild disease. And it, uh, when it's a severe disease, they are going to uh, the admission unit in conventional hospitalization or uh, in the uh, emergency unit. And what we have done is that the CT scanner was performed at the first step when the patient is arriving. And this is our result we have presented before. So we have, uh, uh, for this purpose, a dedicated CT scanner inside the emergency unit. And during this period, only uh, patients, suspicions for COVID or having COVID uh, underwent their uh, CT on this place. It was a dedicated uh, management for this. And yeah, as you can see, uh, we had a cleaning and disinfection procedure, and we received a, a, a large quantity of material for this. There was no problem. There was no problem for this, uh, with a very careful disinfection between each patient. Of course, it takes uh, 15 minutes, but it was necessary. So we were able to perform for a uh, uh, CT uh, scanner per hour, but it was enough for uh, inpatient and for the emergency patient. And okay. of course, we have uh, limited our outpatient activity. It was really a pity because some patients had a severe disease, for uh, example, uh, some oncologic patient, uh, even if we have maintained their, uh, their CT scanner, uh, they uh, were staying at home. And I am sure that in the next, the, the next uh, days and the next weeks, we were receiving a patient with a, a very severe disease. But anyway, so we uh, have postponed many uh, patients except for oncologic patients, but some oncologic patients were not, uh, have not realized their examinations, they were staying at home. Uh, this is our, our statistical uh, analysis. Uh, outpatients were only, uh, during this period, 25%, and inpatient coming with COVID, 75 patients. Uh, before the crisis, uh, uh, it was 50-50, uh, the quantity between in and out patients. 
Okay, so we try to optimize our city acquisition protocols since we are doing a lot of chest CT and that most of the patients were not that very old. We try to lower the radiation dose. So uh, we uh, set up a very simple acquisition protocol for our technologies. Basically, if it was an ICU patient, we always do full dose to have the best image quality. But if it's not an ICU patient, then the techs have a visual evaluation of the patient if he's fit or normal or if he's obese. If he's fit normal and below 40, we just do a very low, so ultra low dose chest CT, DLP below 20. If he's above 40, DLP above 50. And if it's an obese patient, then below 40, we try not to go above 100. And above 40, then we go full dose. And with this, on our 2000 examination, we had a mean DLP of 100, which is actually quite good. And this is an example of the image quality we get. So this was a young patient, 35 years old, a BMI about 33, and we managed to get the LP of 34 with very good image quality. And even though it was only pure ground glass, we were perfectly able to see it. So this is empirical, but I think it's working quite well. Uh, so all the uh, chest CT are reported uh, immediately, so less than 30 minutes before uh, having like the full report. We use a very, very simple report. So this is French, I'm sorry, but basically we're just saying if there are one glass opacities and or other consolidation. For the negative results, we limit ourselves to pleural occlusion, lymph nodes, and chest uh, lung nodules. And then we try to give an impression based in either of four categories. So either this is compatible with COVID-19, either this is infectious lesions but that are not classical or typical for COVID-19. So COVID-19 is less uh, probable. Either these are non-infectious abnormalities, for example, lung cancer, pneumothorax, uh, uh, acute pulmonary edema, or either chest CT is normal. And whenever we report a chest CT normal, we say that there are a risk of false negative, mostly in the three first day of the disease. So this is a very simple way to report, and that's why we were able to keep the the the, the speed of reporting very uh, very uh, very uh, efficiently. So we always use a visual analysis of the CT severity of the disease. It's based on the uh, ST paper. So we give one of five categories based on the evaluation of the whole lung parenchyma. And we feel that this is helping because either mild or moderate have usually the correct or good outcome, but importantly, during critical, are most likely to get uh, hospitalized. As described before, we also found a high incidence of P in COVID-19 patients. And uh, based on what we analyzed on our uh, first month of uh, patients, we recommend doing CTPA for all ICU patients. This is extremely frequent in ICU patients. So whenever an ICU patient has a chest CT that is required, or even an abdominal CT, we always do CTPA. And for other patients, we are doing when the edema levels are high. So we have a higher threshold for the edema than for the, the usual regular patients, or when the clinical evolution is not satisfactory, or when there is a disproportion between almost normal lung parenchyma and the clinical status, which is what's needed. We also have a lot of questions from the clinician about suspicion of co-infection. So they are, we're always saying that I think my patient has another infection, so super infection. Uh, this is frequently suspected, but we found it to be probably quite rare. So we had some chest CT signs that could help, like for example here in alveolar consolidation, some uh, bronchial, uh, bronchial uh, um, sign, uh, leaf nodes like this, or maybe limited uh, plural occlusion, but these are very weak signs. And to be honest, this is not something that uh, we found very frequently. So 
I think we should stay humble with the city on this point. What uh, major problem that we are facing today is the evolution of these patients. So the main question from our clinician is, should we follow up this patient with chest CT? And to be honest, I think we have no definite answer to that. I have just some examples to show you. So this patient was followed because he was enrolled in a clinical trial with an uh, uh, imaging evaluation at uh, two weeks after the, uh, the enrollment. So this is an example of good evolution. The disease initially was only ground glass, milk disease. And at T14, we have almost like good resolution of the abnormalities. This patient was followed up because of clinical worsening. And we can see that the initial disease was a bit different. So mostly ground glass, but with some part of consolidation and some part of radiculations, maybe a bit of crazy paving here. And you see that the evolution here is very different. We have like an increasing of the ground glass and uh, appearing of some uh, fibrosis lesion with some bronchial ectasis and some uh, architectural distortion. So this is extremely different. And this patient, for example, also followed because of clinical trial. In the uh, initial CT scan, we had extensive, mostly pure ground glass opacities, maybe with a bit of crazy paving. And then uh, two weeks after, we have only like a reticular and a little bit uh, subfloral lesions with tiny bronchiectasis. So we have very different pattern of evolution. And the question is, should we have to follow this patient? Should we do it? And to be honest, we have no definite answer. Another patient here, so pure bone glass at the initial CT. So patient had uh, two weeks of ICU stay and was discharged. And this is the chest CT follow up after six days after the discharge. And you see that we have like you know, the overall consolidation with uh, uh, distortion. So very different uh, evolution here. So um, we feel that patient that had severe disease should get uh, follow up chest CT, but we don't know when. Two weeks, four weeks, six weeks is most likely too early. So we try to do it, we will try to do it maybe around uh, three months, for example. But for the patient with uh, mild or moderate disease and good clinical evolution, most likely follow up won't be necessary, but it's not something certain. So that's our problem now. And the second problem now that we have is uh, we will most likely uh, end the lockdown in two or three weeks. And when the lockdown will end, should we do uh, screening with chest CT? So of course there are there is an uh, emphasis of screening of symptomatic patients with PCR. But should we screen patient as well with little to no symptoms with CT? This is uh, something that clinicians might want, but I'm not sure that this is something that can be useful. So these are our two questions currently. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Anna, and thank you, Professor Owa. Uh, it is also very interesting to see that there is a difference also in incidence between Bournemouth, uh, which actually didn't get this huge weight that was expected. But on the other hand, Strasbourg, where uh, there is a huge number of cases in which ultimately the vast number of CT scans were really positive. Also very interesting, your uh, results on the follow-up of these patients. I would like to go on to the next presentation by uh, Dr. Monique Brink from the Rappard University uh, in Nijmegen. So I'd like to give the word uh, to her and we're looking forward to your presentation, Monique. Thank you very much. Um, um, I uh, have a lot to tell. and um, When I listen to the previous two speakers, I think there are a lot of um, questions and still going on and a lot of things we all have been experiencing especially on the morale of the uh, workers at home and the workers in the hospital 
Um, so I would like to give an overview of our experiment experience uh, so far and the questions we still have. Um, we are an academic hospital in the east of the Netherlands. Uh, we upgraded our ICU capacity from 28 beds before COVID until a double number of beds uh, up till now with still available non-COVID care beds um, uh, for patients needing other urgent care. We were actually close to the center of the pandemic in the Netherlands, which was in the east and in the south. Um, so we started to get patients early in March uh, 2020. And due to the social distancing uh, uh, things we had to do and other things uh, applied by the government, we now see that our hospital admissions are decreasing uh, from the end of March. So that's good news. So uh, you all explained how your hospitals went through different phases and we did that as well. We are an, an academic hospital, so we have a lot of research staff, but we also have uh, 50 staff physicians, including nuclear medicine and radiology. And we have four CT scanners, and one of those CT scanners is on the emergency ward as well. And our phases included a preparation phase, an acute phase, and a chronic phase. And in the preparation phase, we were developing risk scenarios and schedules for staff, uh, like you all did. And we already started to move clinical workstations to home offices for home reporting uh, early in March. Uh, we scanned our first COVID-19 patient on March 14th, so that was later than in Strasbourg. Um, and at that moment, 50% of our staff worked from home and our uh, residents were scheduled on all night and weekend shifts and research uh, needed to be suspended. And this was a hospital wide decision. Uh, and we started to do uh, uh, patient care, which I will explain uh, on the next slide. Now we are in the chronic phase, as you explained previously, and we are restarting work at the hospital, uh, but still a lot of people are working from home. So what did we do with our patient management? Um, we developed reporting schemes uh, in a previous um, phase and we explored the role of CT. And as you all know, um, the three hospitals who are included in this webinar all performed CT as a, prim as a primary, which had a primary role in COVID-19 management, but this was not advocated by, for instance, the American College of Radiology, or um, you couldn't base this, this decision based on reports from China, which were pretty enthusiastic about the role of CT in COVID-19 disease, but also had some moderate quality. So it was very hard to decide what the role of CT would be in that phase. Um, so we started to explore this and we made a separate workflow for suspected COVID at the emergency room as well. And we could do this because we had the logistics for that. We had emergency room CT scanner and we were able to make separate workflows and during our acute phase we uh, didn't stop elective care um, we actually did a lot of urgent elective care still we kept on scanning cardiac patients um, in order to avoid collab collateral damage and as long as we were able to do that we kept on doing that and once we would go into another code red or black we would also stop that but we were very lucky that what that was not the case. We performed low dose CT in patients uh, with all airway, all patients with airway symptoms who entered the hospitals, who needed hospitalization, and who were suspected for COVID-19 disease. So, in patients with a high likelihood of COVID-19, we did not scan patients in asymptomatic phases, pre-symptomatic phases, or in patients needing uh, surgery. And now we're going into the chronic phase and we're going to restart or regular care for non-urgent patients as well. So how did we do our logistics? Um, we had the basic assumption that COVID transmission is uh, done via droplets. And well, there has been a lot of discussion about aerosol uh, uh, transmission, but we considered it not, yeah, not very important. So in close collaboration with our hygiene department, we decided to um, do cleansing of any contact surfaces. 
and that that would be sufficient for hygiene and of course um, good preparation of your staff and uh, good protection of your staff and separate routing. So we had one technician in PPE who is in the con contaminated area of the center for three hours. After that, you have to change your clothes because you're not protected anymore. And this te technician is waiting in the CT preparation room, pre pre preparates the patient and then um, um, goes back into the preparation room and the patient is scanned. And we perform a low dose CT scan in all patients with a DLP of about uh, 40. Uh, milligray centimeters, which is way below one millisieverts for most of the patients. Uh, and the technician outside at the console is scanning, of course, and then the patient goes out, gloves are changed, and the room is cleaned. And with that, we could also do four patients per hour. And at the top, we did 40 scans per day, but it was not very, we did it not very frequently. Um, just like in Strasbourg, we had a uniform way of reporting uh, CT scans and in the early phase we had been thinking not only in our hospital but also nationally to do that in a very uniform way in order to be very clear to our clinicians uh, also on likelihood of disease. So we actually um, um, designed more groups of um, likelihood of disease, uh, five groups. In patients who were had a proven COVID-19 disease with an RT-PCR uh, positive result, we call it a CORAT SES, and this CORAT terminology is in line with the RATS, other RATS um, uh, terms from Y RATS, long RATS, etc. Um, with CORAT 1, a very low likelihood of disease, and CORAT 6, a very, very high li likelihood of disease. Um, and this is an example of a COVID-5 patient, and in a COVID-5 patient you need to have the very typical signs of COVID-19 disease with pulmonary involvement, which means bilateral ground glass, with or without consolidations, multifocal, in the periphery or close to the fissures, um, with some kind of confirmatory pattern, such as crazy paving, organizing pneumonia, or something which resembles organizing pneumonia, subpleural bending, all typical findings. And if you see that, you can say this is a COVAT 5 and in our center, 98% of patients with such a pattern actually turned out to have COVID-19. So we had a very high specificity. The term COVAT 4 is also, is kept for patients with typical findings such as peripheral ground glass, but not in a typical distribution, such as in this patient who only has ground glass in a uh, unilateral way, but also uh, if ground glass is, for instance, superimposed on previous other pathology. And if uh, now center, about 80% of patients with this type of, uh, with a CORATS-4 had turned out to have COVID-19. CORATS-3 is the I don't know group. And of course, we have to keep this group as small as possible. So it was like 10 to 15% in our clinical practice. Um, and in this group, you actually can't get any information uh, on likelihood of disease here. Um, but it's very important to be clear on that as well to your clinicians. And finally, we have CORATS 1 and CORATS 2 categories, which means that CORATS 2 is an infectious Im an image of infectious disease, such as an infectious bronchiolitis or bronchi bronchopneumonia, um, which is clearly not COVID-19. So without any typical feature of COVID-19. And finally, we have CORATS-1, which is either a normal chest CT or an abnormal chest CT, but without any sign of infectious pathology. And in this way of calling this likelihood to our clinicians, our clinicians were very rapidly in adapting this um, uh, likelihoods and they were actually using it to making decisions. We were a little bit like, okay, that's really fast, but it actually seems to work and the areas under the curve are pretty high. The observer variability turns out to be high with an area under the curve in, an, in one of our observer studies of 0.91. Uh, but of course you have to bear in mind that 
COVID that pneumonia is not the only expression of COVID-19 disease, such as in this patient, this is a 63-year-old man uh, who came in with uh, hematemesis and um, uh, gastro upper gastrointestinal bleeding. And we performed a CT of chest and abdomen. And as you can see, there is a Colred one lung without any infectious pathology there, uh, but he actually had thickening of the distal esophagus and mucosal enhancement. And this person turned out to have a positive PCR, did not develop any pulmonary symptoms across uh, his hospitalization, uh, but he turned out to have an, an, an uh, COVID-19 infection of his distal esophagus, which is actually really rare. So you have to keep in mind that COVID only resembles pulmonary um, uh, pathology in COVID-19 disease and not other expressions of the disease. We also have a kind of, uh, in a report, we also have a kind of uh, measurement of extent, extent of the disease in order to estimate, um, well, whether there is a kind of measure to uh, predict um, uh, the deterioration of patients or to have a kind of assessment of severity of the disease. We don't actually know whether this will be um, uh, very predictive and we have to combine that with other clinical parameters, of course, and this has been published in many papers already. So our CTSS is a little bit different than what you use in Strasbourg, but I think it's the same intention. So what did we learn? And I think you previously meant it as well, that, that solidarity and collaboration were really, uh, inter yeah, well, were really high. Um, but not only in the departments, also hospital-wide, between departments, but also in the country. So this COVID system was actually developed with a lot of Dutch radiologists who all collaborated, um, which made it important, well, possible to enroll this across the country very fast and, and prove it's very fast. The other downside is the social problems you have when you work at home and the distancing problems we now face at the hospital. How are we going to manage that? And then from the organizational perspective, it really helped to be prepared uh, and to make estimates of different scenarios for the future. Um, and this helped us to change our management fast and frequently and it helped to use uniform reporting. Um, and yeah, what we also learned is that we still kept urgent regular care alive as much as possible in order to reduce collateral damage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brink, for this interesting presentation on the Nibingen experience. Uh, we see that there's a lot of overlap between what has been reported by the various groups. And uh, we all have seen the peak coming, and uh, at least in France and in the Netherlands, we see that it's past it. In England, probably very close to it. So the UK is uh, as a little bit behind us, it looks. Uh, what we also saw, if you go look at the slides of uh, Dr. Brink, uh, she'd been showing, I think it was the third slide, the uh, hospital admission rate in the Netherlands. And what you saw there is a massive difference between areas. That was something that was reflected also in the talk from Dr. Bo. And if you know the situation in France, it's very similar there. So we have areas that are extremely uh, affected and other areas that are much less affected. Um, we also see that uh, all of the three departments have used dedicated scanners for the CT. Uh, of COVID patients. The indication was slightly different, but CT was a very important factor in the diagnosis of these patients. In some areas, it was used for a, a triage situation like in France. Uh, in the Bournemouth, it was mainly used as a uh, problem solving tool. We all see more and more uh, thromboembolic disease, probably a combination of real thrombi, because these patients are extremely thrombogenic, with thrombi almost everywhere, uh, but also probably local thrombosis within the, within the lung. There's a very interesting area of research where we understand not enough. Uh, we've heard about the presentation of COVID uh, with acute abdomen. 
that is something that I think all of us can actually uh, only uh, affirm. So we see that as one of the typical presentations that we have to be always alert to look at the lungs in these specific patients. There is some discrepancy on whether you need to do preoperative CT. We saw our surgeons push that in the country quite a bit. We have an ongoing study in the Netherlands. Um, but what we see, it depends very much on the prevalence of the population. So during the high acute phase of the disease, it's probably a very good idea. But as the disease peters out, this is probably less uh, helpful as we've heard in, in Bournemouth. In Nijmegen, for example, we have decided to use only PCR testing and not a CT for that specific indication. Um, what we have not really touched upon is uh, the, what is done with people with mild disease, whether they are sent to CT or not. We're not doing it, but I have the feeling that Strasbourg is doing that. So I would like to ask Professor Wa or Ohana to uh, maybe comment on that. Do you uh, scan patients with mild COVID symptoms at your place? So in the initial phase, yes, because all the patients were referred uh, to the hospital, mild or moderate or severe disease. But during the peak, only uh, moderate or severe disease were referred to the hospital. So in the initial phase, yes, we were scanning almost everyone. But then afterwards, we were scanning only like patients with significant uh, clinical uh, presentation. And no, we are uh, scanning also only patients with significant clinical presentation. Okay. I think it's very interesting. It very much uh, parallels the experiences that we have. We're now focusing mainly on the moderate and severe symptoms, but we also see that the, the percentage of actual positive scans is going down. So the, the CORAT system that uh, Monique Brick was showing actually worked really, really well in the acute phase. It still works, but we see more and more of CORAT 3 coming up. So basically unusual presentations there are still the occasional fours and fives that are very likely to be COVID, but we see that these become more rare as the disease is slowly leaving uh, the, the background in the, in the general population. I think that's very interesting for the future is uh, the fact that we in the hospitals are only the ones that can basically do whatever we can. And it means that if we are overwhelmed by the disease, we lose it. So it's our population that wins or loses the battle against COVID. And we have seen that the social distancing measures actually work. And it takes about two weeks till we see that the numbers go down and about two, three weeks till the ICU admissions and the deaths go down. So there's a substantial lag time. And if you look at the politics around COVID, we see something that was very similar in all European countries. While COVID was still in China, we said, we're Europe, it doesn't play here. When it was in Italy, we said, we're France, we're the UK, we're the Netherlands, we don't have to care about it. <laughs> then it came to our countries, then it said, in, in, in the Netherlands, we said, it's a problem of Brabant, the area where it first started. And we saw area people that were totally neglecting the fact that you needed to do something. And this has to do with the fact that we humans are really bad when it comes to exponentially growing threats. At the beginning, it is really small, but it doubles every two days. That was the beginning of COVID. You take some measures, it doubles every three to four days, but the numbers are small and nobody really has the feeling it's important. And then comes the time when we suddenly see significant numbers and we realize it's really dangerous. And only then the, the measures have been taken. So what we see in our countries is in these areas where there was a little prevalence and the measures were intact. The number of patients in the hospitals and the ICUs were not overwhelmed. So I think we can really learn from that. And we have to be very careful when kind of easing the measures and going back to normal, that we don't get a second or a third wave of rebound uh, if you do go too fast. I think all of us have to think about the another challenge, which is the backlog of patients that we haven't been treating. So this is a big logistic uh, uh, problem. In Nijmegen, we were lucky because we had decided relatively early on that we keep a certain part of our hospital open for, for regular patients. So our backlog in our department is comparably low. It's about 10 times lower than in other departments. But 
also we see a big uh, problem coming up. But I think that Strasbourg is probably one of the areas where you will have a lot of problems there. Is that true? Yeah, with our uh, ED activity uh, for about a month was like 95% COVID or maybe 97% COVID and we didn't saw any other patient. So some of them go to uh, private practice or uh, like peripheral hospitals because they were really afraid to go to the, our hospital where it was like the, the reference center for COVID. But I think most stayed home and we are beginning to see like patients with late disease as mentioned earlier. So yeah, this is definitely a problem. Yeah, I think it is very interesting also what Dr. Bull said that uh, a lot of patients that usually would go to the doctor now stay at home. So we go back to seeing really full-blown presentations that we were not seeing. We see, for example, our intraarterial thrombolysis for stroke service has completely collapsed, which basically means that a lot of people really suffered a stroke but were not treated. We see similar things for myocardial infarctions. So we will see some collateral damage, which will probably be uh, bigger than we would have hoped for. Um, I would like to close because we have uh, spent already quite a bit of time. Uh, I would like to come to a very last point, uh, what we heard from Dr. Bull, but also from Dr. Brink, but I'm pretty sure it's the same in Strasbourg. COVID was a big catastrophe for those affected. It was a big strain on our healthcare systems, but it also brought out a lot of good in the population, but also in our colleagues, and it actually fostered collaboration. It made things possible that otherwise would take years. And I think the catastrophe has the good side that it also is a big chance of reforming things that we need to reform. And we should really make sure that the chances that we have now are not left unmet uh, and that we actually use them in an uh, optimum fashion so that our healthcare systems come out of this crisis much stronger than before. And with that, I would like to thank everybody for their contribution. I'm Matthias Brokop from Nijmegen, and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bull, Dr. Wa and uh, Oana, and uh, Dr. Brink. And uh, with that, I wish you all a very nice day. Thank you.